Today, we're going to talk about the science of tools that are powerful for fat loss that I'm guessing most of you have never heard about before. Many people want to lose fat. Many people are athletes who need to lose fat. And in general, we know that having body fat percentages that are too high is unhealthy for us. And most people struggle to lose fat. The key thing is to shiver or shivering is a strong stimulus for the release of adrenaline, epinephrine, into fat and the increase in fat oxidation and mobilization. Now, shivering is almost always associated with cold. We think shivering, we think cold because when we get cold, we shiver. And there are two ways that shivering can increase fat loss. And there are several ways that you can use shivering, you can leverage shivering, and you can leverage cold to accelerate fat loss. But you have to do it correctly. Now. How can you do that? Well, if you get into cold water or an ice bath or a cold day and you try and remain calm and resist shivering, you actually short circuit this mechanism for increasing brown fat thermogenesis. The paper published in Nature shows that it is shivering itself that causes the brown fat to increase your burning, your burn rate and your metabolism. And it works like this. When you get into cold and you shiver, the shivering, those that low level movement of the muscle, those small movements triggers the release of a molecule called succinate, S-U-C-C-I-N-A-T-E, succinate. And succinate acts on the brown fat to increase brown fat thermogenesis and fat burning overall. It actually increases body heat through this brown fat thermogenesis pathway. How many times a week do you need to expose yourself to cold will depend on how much fat you're trying to lose and how much you're trying to increase your metabolism. There are studies that describe positive effects on fat loss of exposing yourself to cold either through cold shower or through ice bath or other cold water. It doesn't have to actually have ice in it provided it's cold enough for anywhere between one and five times per week. But it turns out that just one exposure per week can be valuable. The question then is how long to get into that cold environment and how cold should that environment be? So first let's talk about how long to get into that cold environment. The answer here might be a little bit different than you might imagine. Most of you might think, oh, well, if one minute is good, three minutes is better. And if three minutes is better, then 10 minutes is best. But Remember, the goal is to get the shiver-induced release of succinate so that succinate can trigger the brown fat. It turns out that if you want to trigger the shiver, what you want to do is to get into the cold and then get out of the cold and typically not dry off. So here's a potential kind of sets reps protocol that you can play with. Find a temperature that induces shiver for you. That's going to vary depending on your cold tolerance and how cold adapted you are. One to three, maybe five times a week. Get in until you, or get under the shower or whatever it is, until you start to shiver, genuinely shiver. Then after about a minute or so, get out, spend one to three minutes out, but don't dry off. Get back in for anywhere from one to three minutes, but try and access the shiver point again. And you might do three repetitions of that. So it's three times in and three times out total. Okay. That's a great starting place. And what you don't want to do is build up your tolerance to cold so fast that pretty soon you're able to resist the shiver because remember, the shiver is the source of the succinate release that will trigger brown fat thermogenesis. There are things that people can ingest that will allow them to oxidize more fat. And that occurs mainly by increasing the amount of epinephrine that is released from neurons that innervate fat tissue. One of the more common ones is one that you may already be using, which is caffeine. Now, caffeine for burning more fat, for oxidizing and mobilizing more fat is an interesting one. It can be effective at dosages up to 400 milligrams. Some people like the way they feel drinking 100 to 200, 300, maybe even 400 milligrams of caffeine before training. And indeed, that will lead to increased fat oxidation. It will do that because you will release more epinephrine and adrenaline. What are some of the other things that are, are useful and interesting? Well, in terms of tools that are actionable and have reasonable safety margins, I've talked before about uh, something called GLP-1. This is something that uh, 
can be triggered by the ingestion of yerba mate, which is a tea. The short takeaway is mate increases GLP-1 and yes, increases the percentage of fat that you'll burn. It increases fat burning. And that is especially true, it turns out, from the scientific literature, if you ingest mate prior to exercise of any kind. So if you want to burn more fat, drinking mate before exercise is good. Drinking it at rest when you're not exercising will also help shift your metabolism toward enhanced burning of fat by increasing fat oxidation. Some people who don't like mate might prefer something like guayusa, which is spelled G-U-A-Y-U-S-A. It's a sweeter tasting tea. It doesn't have any sweetener in it, but the leaf of the guayusa plant is sweeter than the mate plant. I sometimes will mix the two and then make the tea with that. And there's one more compound that I think we should discuss in terms of increasing fat loss, and that's carnitine or acetyl L-carnitine. They lie in the same pathway. We can return to our basic knowledge now of fat mobilization and oxidation. After fat is mobilized and makes it into cells and needs to be oxidized, so the literally the burning of fat and conversion of it into energy, that is accomplished and is facilitated by the presence of glucagon being elevated. GLP increases that process and insulin being low. L-carnitine and acetyl L-carnitine in particular facilitates fat oxidation. It helps convert fatty acids into ATP. And indeed, supplementing L-carnitine can increase fat loss. That's been shown. At what dosages? Well, People ingest anywhere from 500 milligrams to two grams per day in divided doses, typically. Some people who are really extreme are taking injectable L-carnitine. I've certainly not tried that. Um, I confess I have used it in pill form from time to time, but in part because of the fat oxidation effects, but also because of the other effects that it tends to have. Now that you understand the cellular process by which fat is mobilized and oxidized, it should make sense that if L-carnitine is important for converting fatty acids into energy, then supplementing L-carnitine makes sense. Acetyl L-carnitine is the type of L-carnitine or the form of L-carnitine, I should say, that is transported and utilized most easily by the body. And so that's why sometimes we distinguish between L-carnitine and acetyl L-carnitine.